I just want to take a second to welcome everybody to the Chime 2 FAES Microbiome Bioinformatics with Chime 2 Workshop. Uh, with Chime 2 Workshop, we're so excited to have you here, and we have been working tirelessly over the last couple months to put a ton of new content together um, for this event. And so, we are just as excited as you are. Um, I want to mention the bottom left of this slide that is up right now has a short link to these. Um, you also have a link to these slides in the slide deck. If you have two screens in front of you, it may be uh, helpful for you during the lectures to have the slides up on one screen and have the video up on another screen. Um, you'll notice already on this first slide that we have a lot of links embedded in these slides. Now, in general, if there's a link that is important for the workshop, um, and so, for example, something to the Galaxy server or the Zulip chat, you will also already have that link in Zulip. Um, but you'll see as we go through the talk, I have links to references, um, other information um, that you may want um, access to. Um, okay, so. Um, I just want to get started by acknowledging our instructor team. So Matt mentioned we have about 20 instructors involved uh, in this event. Um, these are individuals from around the world who are part of the Chang2 development and education community. Um, and uh, in this particular case, we have instructors joining us from five countries. Um, and so that is always exciting for us to have people from around the world uh, joining in to help teach Chang2. Um, I just want to um, draw special attention to five of the folks on this list. Um, I want to thank Matt Dillon, Evan Bullion, Liz Garrett, Keegan Evans, and Mike Robeson. Um, and so um, first four of those folks, uh, Matt, Evan, Liz, and Keegan, are um, research software engineers in my lab at NAU and have been very involved in um, preparation for this workshop, including a lot of the new tools that we're gonna be using in this workshop. That includes our new tutorial data set, which we're using for the first time at this event, um, and the Galaxy server, which we are teaching with for the first time. Um, and Mike Robeson um, is uh, joining us in the control room, um, learn, uh, doing some training to lead these types of events in the future. Um, and so all of these folks are instrumental in um, bringing this event to you this week. I also just want to take a minute to thank our funders. Um, so the Chang2 project is primarily funded by the National Cancer Institute's Infor, uh, informatics technology for cancer research. Um, in the past, the project has also been directly funded by the National Science Foundation and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, and there are uh, several other um, uh, funding sources for different aspects of this workshop. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank our hosts, the Foundation for Advanced Education in the Sciences at the NIH, um, we have been working with FAS for uh, several years now, probably about four or five years now, and uh, Hazuki, Terry, and Caroline are always a pleasure to work with and do a lot of the work behind the scenes that make this whole thing smooth um, for you as the students. So now let's jump in and start talking about Chang2. So when I begin these talks, I like to um, start at what I think of as the very beginning of microbiome research. Um, and that really begins um, in the late 1600s with Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who is credited with the discovery of microorganisms, which he referred to as animacules. Um, and so von Leeuwenhoek created very powerful microscopes for the time. Um, you can see uh, an image of how these were used on the left, and so the light source would be a candle or some uh, source of daylight, and a specimen would be put on the end of this pin that you see up on the, uh, in the image on the top right, and you would look through this lens to uh, view the object. And Van Loon have pointed his microscopes at just about anything he could think of. Um, he's credited with discovering all the types of cells that you see over on the left, um, and what you see over on the right are some images that were taken, photographs that were taken with a modern day um, replica of von Leeuwenhoek's microscope. 
Um, and so, of course, Van, Van Leeuwenhoek's animalcules came to be known as microorganisms or microbes. Now, now as time progressed, we added tools um, such as culturing to the uh, to our tool chests for studying microorganisms. Um, and so that includes things like monoculture or polyculture. Um, for example, um, uh, Winogradsky columns over on the right would be an example of polyculture. Um, and these are very similar to the types of communities that we study today. Um, and so more recently, um, of course, the tool that has been added to the tool chest um, that we have that that brings us to this uh, technologies that we're learning about at this workshop is culture independent investigation of microbial communities. Um, and so just to get us all on the same page, I'm going to spend a minute um, talking about this and how it works. And I realize this will be review for most of the folks. Um, in the audience today, but um, I find this to be helpful just for uh, developing a common language before we really dive in. Um, so these types of culture independent investigations of microbial communities make use of the fact that all cellular life has a shared evolutionary history and that some genes are shared by all organisms. The sequence of those genes can be used as a genetic fingerprint for different organisms. And when we take that approach, we are usually using um, a DNA sequencing instrument. Um, this is an image of the Illumina MySeq, which is a very commonly used um, sequencing instrument for studying microorganisms. Um, and um, the way that this typically works, um, and if we just think about um, uh, just how this might look over time, um, if you imagine that there is some ancestral organism that contains this short sequence in its genome, this is much shorter in practice uh, than what we would use in practice, um, but has this short sequence in their genome. Um, and over time, random mutations um, begin to accumulate in that sequence. Um, and so you can see here, um, over some amount of time, some mutations have been introduced such that the two derived sequences um, still look similar to that ancestral sequence, but contain some differences. Um, and as time uh, continues to progress, more of these mutations accumulate. Um, and that brings us to modern day organisms um, where we see some, uh, we can see signatures of homology in gene sequences, but we also see those differences. And those differences give us the information that we need for identifying organisms based on their, their DNA sequences. So the most commonly used gene in these types of fingerprinting studies is the small subunit ribosomal RNA gene. Um, this gene is used um, primarily for a couple of reasons. First, it's ubiquitous. So all known cellular life encodes the 16S ribosomal RNA in its genome. Um, and additionally, it contains some regions that are identical across diverse organisms. That's important so that we can isolate that region of the genome and amplify it using PCR. And it contains some regions that are highly variable across organisms. And that, of course, is important for identifying different organisms based on their sequence. Our fingerprints wouldn't be very useful for identifying us if they were all identical to one another. Um, so, that um, sequencing of ribosomal RNA and other marker genes is a more modern addition to our sequencing um, or our uh, uh, my microbiology tool chest. Um, and it has led to numerous, um, uh, numerous discoveries that have really ushered in the era of microbiome science. Um, and so, first of all, it led us to the realization that we live in a microbial world. Uh, so, what I've done um, in this slide is I've taken an image of um, the phylogenetic tree of life. And so, this represents the three domains of life. And I have highlighted examples of the multicellular organisms in that tree. 
And so um, what you can see is us and our relatively close relatives, corn and mushrooms and seaweed, all cluster together in this tip of the eukaryotic branch of the tree of life. The vast majority of the diversity of life on Earth, so the rest of this tree, is represented by or uh, contains single cellular organisms. And so um, as multicellular organisms, we are in the minority of life on Earth. Um, it has also helped us to understand that microbes live in complex and diverse communities basically everywhere on Earth. Um, and so um, almost without fail, wherever we try and collect these 16S ribosomal RNA sequences, we collect sequences from many, many different organisms. Um, that includes in and on our bodies, um, in our plants, in our foods, in what we think of as extreme environments, um, such as hot springs in uh, Yellowstone National Park. Um, and we're now beginning to take this knowledge and use it um, in, uh, in human health, in environmental science, and in many other fields. And so just some of the things that um, these technologies have led us to um, is an understanding that our microbiomes impact the efficacy of medical treatment. Um, and so I find this to be one of um, the most exciting current areas of microbiome research um, is understanding, for example, how we might be able to modulate the human microbiome to improve um, uh, treatment for disease. And so this was a very famous paper um, that was published by Rowdy et al. Um, I believe this was uh, a few years ago now. I don't remember exactly what year. Um, but what they showed was that the uh, uh, immunotherapy for cancer treatment was more or less effective depending on um, the, the composition of the recipient's microbiome. Um, and so this really um, is opening up um, a lot of new areas for uh, medical treatment, really new fields within uh, medical treatment. Um, uh, this technology has also been very widely applied in environmental science and agricultural science. Um, an area that is of personal interest to me is understanding how microbes um, can help us reduce our impact on the planet. Um, for example, by composting waste and degrading pollution. Um, and these technologies um, will also lead to um, things like new varieties of food and more sustainable crops. And we're seeing, um, and in fact, many, uh, some of you in the audience may be working on these types of applications. Um, and so um, what I wanna do now is I just wanna talk a little bit about how some of these different approaches impact the view of the microbial world as we see it. Um, and so if you imagine that this gray box that I have up on the screen represents the microbial world, um, the, um, the circles within that box represent the region of that microbial world that we see with different technologies. Um, and so for example, culturing um, illuminates a relatively small region of that microbial world. Um, Evan, if it's possible, could you mute your microphone? I'm just picking up some noise. Um, so in the control room here, um, I can hear some things that are happening so that, uh, that, that are not broadcast over the stream. And so you may hear us um, uh, every once in a while asking Evan a question um, in the background. And so we can hear him, but you can't doubt on the live stream. Um, so, uh, like I was saying, culturing illuminates a relatively restricted um, view of the microbial world. Um, if we throw in um, some sort of a sequencing technology, and so imagine that we sequence the 16S ribosomal RNA, um, and we do that with primers that amplify the V6 region. Now, those primers um, work very well for some specific organisms, but they're not very broad spectrum primers. And so they're not um, uh, extremely sensitive. And so maybe we get a view of the microbial world um, that is slightly bigger than we get with culturing, but is still um, not giving us a view into most of the microbial world. Um, now, different primer choices with the 16S 
um, will illuminate mostly overlapping regions, but different regions um, in some uh, in some areas. And so, for example, if we were to sequence the V2 or the V4 region of the 16S, we would observe many of the same organisms, but there might be some some taxa that we see with V2 that we don't see with V4. And there may be some that we see with V4, but not with V2. And that's illustrated by the overlapping and non-overlapping regions of these circles. Um, and so all of this is important when you are attempting to either formally combine the results from different studies in a meta-analysis or a pooled analysis of microbiome data, or sort of informally combining or comparing results. So you're reading a paper that used V2 primers and you're comparing that against a paper that used V4 primers, it's important to be aware that you're getting mostly the same view of the microbial world, but not exactly the same view. Um, this also extends to um, other aspects of our analysis, our uh, preparation workflow. And so for example, um, different DNA extraction techniques will give you mostly the same communities, but there may be some organisms that are better or worse um, viewed with different extraction technologies. Um, and there's another approach um, that I suspect many of you have in your mind uh, as I've been talking through all of this so far, and that is shotgun metagenomic sequencing. Um, and so the idea with shotgun metagenomic sequencing is rather than targeting a specific marker gene like the 16S or the um, ITS or the 18S, um, you sequence all of the DNA that is present in a sample. Um, and so this promises to get a broader view of the microbial world, but it still might not necessarily be completely comprehensive. Um, so for example, if some organisms are um, if some organisms are uh, DNA can't be extracted with a certain extraction kit, we may still miss some of those organisms. Um, and so shotgun offers um, some benefits over 16S. Um, it uh, has some drawbacks relative to 16S as well. Um, and so just for example, when you are working with human microbiome samples, you will typically end up with a lot more human reads in your shotgun data than you will in a 16S um, survey. And we um, can talk about some of those pros and cons a bit over the next few days. Um, if you have questions about when you might wanna do shotgun sequencing versus marker gene sequencing, put those into Zulip and we can either address them um, at the end of the day or in uh, some other Q&A sessions we have throughout the day. Um, so when I think of microbiome uh, analysis these days, I tend to think of GIS or geographic information systems as a good analogy to where we are with the technologies right now. Um, and so in a GIS system, um, you can turn on or off different layers of information depending on uh, what it is you're trying to model about the real world. Um, and so, for example, if you are planning a hiking trip versus planning a building project, you may need um, some information in one case that you don't necessarily need in the other case. And so you can turn on or off those layers to um, help you uh, build the model that you need. Now, with microbiome science, um, our technology is expanding in new directions. Um, and so in addition to the um, sort of taxonomic profiling or phylogenetic profiling of communities with marker genes, and so things like 16S or ITS or 18S surveys, um, we are now seeing additional da uh, data layers um, being added as possibilities. Um, and so, for example, you can uh, functionally profile communities using shotgun metagenomic sequencing, um, and that is really uh, going to give you an idea of the functional potential of a community. So what genes are present in this environment? Um, and more and more, we're seeing functional activity being profiled. Um, and so metatranscriptomics, metaproteomics, and metabolomics 
offer uh, different approaches, some sequencing based, some not sequencing based for assessing functional activity. And depending on the questions that you have about a microbial ecosystem, you may want to turn on or off these different layers. And so sometimes you may want to do a metabolome and 16S survey. Um, other times you might want to do a uh, shotgun metagenome and a met metatranscriptome survey. Um, you, as you are planning your study, you should be thinking about what data layers are important to address the questions. And so more recently, our tool chest is being filled out with things like mass spectrometry to study the small molecules in an environment, highly multiplex bacterial genome sequencing, um, and so on. Um, and so that really brings us to CHIME 2 and the CHIME 2 project. Um, and so CHIME 2 um, is a microbiome multiomics bioinformatics platform. Um, the uh, original, um, so as Matt mentioned in the introduction, I'm the PI on the CHIME 2 project, but this is really a community developed project. And that is well illustrated by the author list on the CHIME 2 paper. Um, so this paper we published in July of 2019. There were 112 co-authors on this paper representing 77 different institutions in 10 different countries. And all of these individuals contributed to the design, the development, the documentation, or the support of CHIME 2. And so while my lab leads the development, this is really a massive global collaboration. It's also illustrated in the um, instructors that we have um, helping out with this event this week. Um, so like I said, we've got about 20 instructors from five different countries here this week. Um, and um, Chime is very widely used in microbiome research, um, ranging from everything like the um, immunotherapy studies um, that I mentioned earlier, to environmental microbiome science, um, food microbiome science, really across the spectrum of microbiome research. Um, this platform has been instrumental. Um, to date, there's been about 32,000 um, citations of the Chime platform. That includes Chime 1 and Chime 2. Um, and uh, it continues to be very widely used and cited. Um, Chime 2 is completely free and open source. Um, so what that means is that you have a licensed right to use Chime 2 to re redistribute it, even modify it if you want to. Um, we are very uh, interested in having contributions from the community to Chime 2. Um, and so um, if you're interested in getting involved, we will have information about how you can do that. Um, you, uh, the open source aspect means that should you want to, you can go audit every line of code um, in the Chang2 platform, um, including the plugins, um, the uh, framework, interfaces, and so on. Um, and it is fully tested. So we use um, a variety of different software testing approaches to ensure the reliability and the accuracy of the system. Um, this uh, licensed right to use um, includes commercial applications. So if you are working in industry, you also have a licensed right to use Chime 2 for free. Um, we believe that open science is, um, is essential to moving research forward, and that is what motivates us to make this platform open and free, one of the things. Um, I do just want to mention, in case there are any Chime 1 users out there anymore, um, Chime 2 has succeeded Chime 1 as of January of 2018, and Chime 1 is no longer supported. I have a blog post linked from this slide um, where you could learn about what that means. Um, but in short, uh, you're here, you're going to be learning Chime 2. Um, and so if you had been using Chime 1 in the past, you should plan to um, switch entirely to Chime 2. It's really better in every way than Chime 1, so there's really no reason to be using Chime 1 anymore. Um, if you disagree with that, if there's something that you are using from Chime 1, we would love to hear about it. 
Um, now, Chime 2 can be installed in a number of different ways. That includes natively on your computer. Um, and so you can install this on your Mac, Windows, or Linux computer. Um, you can install this using virtual machines. You can use this on Amazon Web Services. Um, and there's uh, other ways as well that you can uh, use Chime 2. And so whether you have your own hardware, um, so whether you have a server in the lab or just a laptop that you're running this on um, or a cluster at your institution or none of those resources, um, you would have the opportunity to use the Amazon Cloud. So regardless of what your computing infrastructure looks like, there are ways for you to use Chain 2. Um, and so now I want to just spend a few minutes um, talking about some of the features of Chime 2 that initially bring users to the system. Um, the first is that we are focused on having the latest and greatest microbiome bioinformatics methods and visualizations. Um, and so when we first got started with this platform, um, that included um, supporting things like the transition from OTU clustering to Amplicon sequence variants um, that was happening at the time. And this resulted from some of the improved quality control tools that were becoming available. Um, specifically, uh, Data2 is what uh, comes to my mind and really enabled us to start doing um, this 100% OTU clustering, essentially, or just defining Amplicon sequence variants. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what this means. And so if I'm using some terms that are unfamiliar to you, don't worry about it. We will be covering this in a lot of detail over the next few days. Um, but this enabled a higher resolution view of microbial communities. And more recently, we have been um, continuing that. And so um, some of the folks who are involved in this workshop, including Ben Kaler and Nick Bakulich, um, led the development of tools that enable even higher resolution of taxonomy using environmentally aware classifiers. Um, we will have some links in the tutorial to where you can learn more about this. Um, and we continue to uh, work on moving the field forward. And so, um, for example, we um, are now working on building some new functionality to do analysis of fecal microbiome transplant data. Um, and this is just one example of new functionality that is on the horizon. Um, Chain 2 supports interactive visualizations um, to help you explore your data. Um, we will be working with some of these visualizations that I'm highlighting here uh, during the workshop over the next couple of days. Um, another feature that attracts users to the system is accessibility of the system through accurate, detailed, and interesting documentation um, and well-designed interfaces. Um, and so we are constantly working on our documentation. And a really great example of that is the tutorial that you will be uh, working through this week. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is an entirely new tutorial and new, tu new tutorial data set. Um, we are constantly trying to think about what is the cutting edge, what, what uh, data is being used on the cutting edge of the field, and trying to integrate that into how we teach Chang 2. Um, our goal with these tutorials is to give you a data set that you can learn to use the tools with and that you could then adapt to apply to your own data. Um, we also, um, just on that thread of new ways to learn Chang 2, we have a Chang 2 YouTube channel. Um, this is available. Um, on YouTube under the Chang2 channel. Um, we have a lot of content going up there. And one of the things that we hope to do with this in the near future is as new plugins are becoming available and being published to have the developers of those plugins um, publish short videos on the YouTube channel to help you as the user um, learn about those. And so um, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, I would recommend um, going and subscribing and then that way you can um, be alerted to new content as it becomes available. Um, and the other thing that attracts users to the system 
is the community of microbiome scientists, developers, and bioinformaticians involved in Chang2. Um, the hub of the Chang2 community is the Chang2 Forum. Um, we are posting, uh, there are, um, there are uh, new posts every day. There are thousands of users on the forum. This slide is a little bit outdated right now, um, but um, uh, you can see that we have had a lot of growth in um, number of visits, um, number of new users to the forum. Um, and in addition to being a place where you can go get free technical support for Chime 2, um, this is also a place where you can um, discover community developed content. Um, and so for example, one of the most frequently um, uh, viewed posts on the forum is a, uh, uh, was contributed by a user um, and that was a translation of some of our tutorial documentation into Chinese. Um, that individual um, ended up co-authoring the Chang2 paper with us for this um, uh, for this contribution, which was so widely viewed. And so I mentioned that as an example of how um, people get involved um, in the Chang2 development and support and documentation community. A lot of that starts on the Chang2 forum. Um, we are also regularly hosting workshops. Um, and so you, of course, are at one of these right now. Before the pandemic, we did these in person um, and we would focus these on hands-on activities and small discussion sessions, opportunities for um, participants to um, meet and network with one another. Um, and we try and recapture those aspects of this in our online workshops and um, we have I, uh, we are doing pretty good with that. We've had good feedback on our previous online workshops, and we would love to hear from you um, during or after the week um, to learn about any thoughts you have that could um, help improve these in the future. Um, so I'm going to wrap up starting to talk about some of the lower level features. Um, and these are things that you might not be aware of um, right now, but which you will learn about this week. Um, so first is the decentralized provenance tracking system that we built for Chime2. Now, this automates the bioinformatics record keeping, which facilitates reproducible microbiome science. Um, and so I like to talk about this in the context of um, what I think of as the what did you do five months ago problem. Um, so now imagine that you have done a lot of microbiome analysis um, maybe you have taken some notes with that information. Um, and so maybe you've tracked all of the successful commands that you ran throughout your analysis and annotated what each one was doing. Um, and maybe you've got some directory of files that contain all of the data. Now, maybe you submit your paper, um, it goes through review, and you get some questions coming back that's, um, you know, for example, asking about what versions of some underlying software dependency you used, or what version of, uh, or sorry, what value you provided for a specific parameter. Now, maybe you have that in your notes. Um, maybe you have some information on that in your directory. Um, but it's possible that you don't have that information. Maybe you didn't track, maybe you forgot to track that specific command, or maybe the server that you ran this on um, doesn't exist anymore. Maybe that machine was reformatted. Um, and so you don't know what version of some underlying dependency was installed. And so you end up in a situation where you might not be able to answer questions that a reviewer had. Um, in the worst case, that might mean that you need to redo all of the analyses to be able to um, accurately answer that question. Well, with, uh, when we started designing Chime 2, we had run into many users who experienced this type of issue with Chime 1. And so what we decided to do was build this sort of um, data provenance tracking into the system. And so anytime you are interacting with, uh, or sorry, any uh, Chime2 result that you create contains detailed information that you can access when you need to um, about how that result was created. 
And so that includes the type of information that I was just describing. Um, so like what specific parameters were used, versions of underlying dependencies, order of operations that were applied. Um, and so I won't go into this in any more detail right now, but over the course of the week, in addition to teaching you how to use Chime 2, we're gonna teach you how to explore data provenance and where those results came from. Um, Chime 2 also supports multiple user interfaces. Um, the same functionality is accessible through Galaxy, which is what we're gonna use in this workshop, through the Chime 2 command line interface, which um, if you're already a Chime 2 user is most likely what you've uh, worked with so far, um, and also through a Python 3 API. Um, and so if you are a data scientist versus a power user versus a domain scientist, regardless of where you are on that spectrum of computational sophistication, there is an interface that will help you work most efficiently with Chang2 and that will give you access to all of the same functionality. Now there's a fourth interface there um, that we will use quite a lot throughout this week called Chime2 View. And this is a read-only interface that allows you to view results on machines that uh, do not have Chime2 installed. Um, and so this is um, helpful for sharing links with collaborators. And so for example, if you generate an inter interactive Chime2 visualization on your computer, and you wanna share that with your boss who doesn't have Chime2 installed and doesn't wanna have Chime2 installed, you can share the link with them through Chime2 View, and they will be able to interact um, with that result on their own computer or iPad or um, phone, um, really across different uh, types of computers. Um, the last thing I'm gonna mention here is that Chime2 is built on a plugin architecture, and that is how we keep pace with the field. Um, and so what this means, um, and especially of note for the bioinformat bioinformatics developers out there in the audience, anybody can create and distribute a Chime2 plugin. All of the bioinformatics functionality in Chime2 is defined in the form of plugins. Um, that functionality uh, under the hood can be implemented in Python 3, but it can also be implemented in R or C++. Um, the uh, the plugin is like a Python 3 wrapper for that software. Um, so as developers, um, you may be interested in this because it allows you to rapidly get new microbiome tools that you're building in the hands of a lot of users. Um, as users, you care about this because it means that if there's some new functionality being developed, you don't have to wait, for example, for my team to implement that functionality in Chime 2, the developer of that can make that accessible to you through all of the different Chime 2 interfaces. Um, now the hub for Chime 2 development, or uh, sorry, Chime 2 plugins, um, is the Chime 2 library. You can find that at library.chime2.org. Um, and that work was funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, we will talk a little bit about the library um, here and there throughout the week. Um, so what's next for Chang 2? Where are we going with this? Well, I mentioned in the beginning of my talk that Chang 2 is a microbiome multiomics platform. Um, and so the real core focus of our development right now is moving beyond marker gene surveys, which is where Chang 2 came from, to supporting uh, analysis and integration of these different microbiome data layers. Um, and the way that we're doing this is by working with our developers around the world. Um, and so for example, the Bakulich lab at ETH Zurich is building a suite of shotgun metagenomics plugins um, that um, will ultimately enable end-to-end -end analysis of shotgun data through Chang2. Um, similarly, we are working with teams who are building plugins for metatranscriptome, metaproteome, and metabolome analysis. Um, we are also constantly working on new ways to use Chang2. Um, Galaxy is a great example of that, which you are going to learn again a lot about this week. 
Um, we also, um, uh, within the next few years, we'll be building an R API so that you will be able to access all of the Chime 2 functionality, uh, including in third-party plugins, through the R programming language. You can do that right now with Python 3, um, but we realize that many of our users are um, R developers, and so we are working to support that community. In the meantime, if you are an R user or developer, um, there's a very cool tool, um, third party called Chime 2 R, that allows you to load Chime 2 data in R. Um, one of the other features that we are working on right now is called Provenance Replay. Um, what that means is that you can take an existing Chime 2 result and via that data provenance that I mentioned a few minutes ago, you can generate new executable code. Um, so you can generate Python code or um, command line interface code, so bash, um, uh, bash commands. Um, and what that does is it makes it easier to rerun analyses either that you ran before or that others have run before. Um, this work is being done um, primarily by Chris Keefe, who's one of our instructors and a master's student in my lab. Um, because of all this cool functionality, um, we are also working on moving Chang2, um, the moving the Chang2 framework into new domains. And so, like many folks, we have gotten involved in some SARS-CoV-2 research over the last couple of years. Um, we are building some plugins to support that type of work. Um, first example of that is Genome Sampler, which um, was published a couple of years ago now, a year and a half ago now, um, and a lot more. Um, so I have a post up on the Chime 2 forum. The link is down on the bottom right of this slide. And so you can learn about uh, some of the other things that are coming to the Chime 2 ecosystem. Um, so with that, I am going to um, wrap up this introductory talk. Um, and I think we may um, have a couple minutes for questions if any came in. Um, and uh, we will uh, then move on to getting everybody connected to the server. So thanks for your time.